Good evening. It's great to see everyone out this evening. If you have your Bibles, please be turning to Colossians with me. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. You know, if you turn on the television, you'll, you'll hear a story. Uh, a child in this state went into school. He was angry at someone over here. And he opened fire and shot his classmates. Why did he do that? You see someone walking down the street, or you read in the newspaper, someone was walking down the street, and some other person, didn't know him, didn't know anything about him, jumps out, knocks him in the head, takes his wallet, and runs off. Why did he do that? You can see YouTube videos of children. Something's taken away. They begin to throw a fit and they clench their fist and they start attacking their parents and yelling at their parents and screaming at their parents in anger. Why did they do that? What caused them to get to that point? That's something we're going to study tonight. What causes us to do what we do? We're going to be looking at God's design for a family, but also God's design for a person. So if you have your Bibles, let's look here for just a moment. We usually begin the study of God's design for a family by looking at Colossians chapter 3 and verses 18 through 25, but it's really not fair to start there. Because if we just start there, we forget all of the things He wrote leading up to verse 18. We miss all of the things that lead us towards being good, godly parents. All of the things that lead us toward being good, godly husbands and good, godly wives and good, godly children. We miss all of those things if we just start simply at verse 18. Now, it's obvious I'm not an expert at raising children yet. And obviously, I have not reached the pinnacle of knowing all the ins and outs. I have not been married long enough to know all of the situations and all of the struggles that we're going to face in time as there are ups and downs in any relationship. I've not yet been married long enough to understand those things, but this is what I do know. There is a God in heaven who understands all of those things, who understands how to teach us, and He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, hasn't it? Has He not provided us with everything that we need to be faithful parents and faithful spouses? So let's begin by understanding that in order to understand why this child went in and and shot up this school or why this man attacked this person, we have to get to what he believes. And we have to get to what we believe because that changes what we do. If this person believes in God and this person doesn't believe in God, is there certain things that are going to be different in that person's life? Are there certain morals that are going to be in that person's life that wouldn't be in the other? And are there certain actions that would not be permissible in one life that would be permissible in another? So let's go back to First or Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 2, because as we looked at this morning, he begins by making a statement that is so profound to the Christian. He says, To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, notice it, as we looked at this morning, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have heard before me, and you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. He says, listen, what do you believe about God? Do you believe that God is? Do you believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him? Do you believe that that Jesus is the Christ? But something else He says, praying always for you. Always praying for these people. Do children need to see us pray? Absolutely. Do our spouses need to see us pray? Yes. Do people in the world need to know that we are people who pray and have thanksgiving in our lives for all of the things God has done for us? Absolutely. He says, since we have heard of your faith, verse 4, he's heard of their faith. How did he hear of their faith? Does news spread? If you hear about something going over here, how long does it take before that reaches everybody in this room? Especially in today's world. I hit sin, it can go to everybody I know. News travels fast. He said, listen, I have heard 
of your faith in Christ Jesus. And notice what he says. Not just your love for God, but notice what he says, verse 4. And the love which you have to all the saints. It's about our relationship to each other and our relationship to God. That's what our belief is founded upon. For the hope. What are we looking forward to? What are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to eternity where? In heaven. We're looking forward to an eternity in heaven. That's our goal. That's our hope. That's where we want to be. Do we believe that that place is real? Do we live like we believe that that place is real? Do we live like we believe hell is real? Hell is a scary thought, isn't it? I'm not particularly fond of the dark. I'm definitely not particularly fond of fire. But could you imagine being in a place that is completely dark, yet you're still burning with fire, and that never will end? The rich man that looked up and asked Abraham, could you just send Lazarus to give me just a a drop of water? Just a drop. He's still in that same place today. 2,000 years later. And this is just the beginning. Because time, as we know it, hasn't even ended yet. His eternity has not even truly begun. So do we really live like there's a heaven? And do we really look at others that are lost around us as though there is a hell? Look in verse 9. He says, For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with, notice what we said earlier, what we said this morning, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We have to have knowledge of Him, don't we? Knowledge to get grace. Knowledge to grow. But as we, as we look at this in context, as we begin to study what is it, What is it that causes us to do what we do? It's kind of like a pyramid, where the base of that pyramid, what a person does, why a person does the things that they do, you can start with that bottom layer, and that bottom layer is their belief. And that belief is going to dictate everything that they do from there. From their belief, they're going to get their morals and their convictions, right? Right? That's where that comes from. Their belief and their convictions come, or their convictions and their morals come from their beliefs. And from their morals, from their convictions, we'll see their actions. That's the stuff we can see. That's their behavior. That's the patterns that we can see from them. Too many times we try to just treat the surface, don't we? We see a problem. Let's stop the problem. But in order to stop that problem, we have to get down to what? As some would say, we've got to get to the heart of the matter. We've got to get to the root of the problem. We have to get down and find out what makes that person do the things that they do. What in their belief system teaches their morals that that's okay to do? Do we have to do that with our children? To learn about them. What makes this child act this way? What is going on up here where he thinks that's okay? So we have to do that with, especially with children. So it's kind of like a pyramid. But in order for us to teach our children, we have to first understand what we believe. That's the most important part. It's not teaching our child uh, how to get into the best school. It's not teaching our child what, what the best profession is. It's not teaching our child all of these different things in the world. What is the most important thing we could ever teach our child? What is the most important example we could ever put forth for our spouse? What's the most important example we could ever show to the world? Faithfulness to God. Isn't it? Isn't that the most important thing you could ever show someone? 
Notice verse 9. He says, For this cause also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you. And we desire that you might be filled with knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing. Notice it now, in the knowledge of God. You have to continue increasing in the knowledge of God. And when you do that, you'll be strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. What's His power for the saving of the soul? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. So strengthen with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And this is so important to the Christian in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Do you believe that Jesus Christ walked upon this earth? Do you believe that He lived a sinless life? Do you believe that they grabbed Him, that they took Him, and they dragged Him before the the council, and that they took Him out and they beat Him and they wounded Him, that they took Him up and they put Him on a cross and they pierced His side? Do you believe that He died there? that they put Him in a tomb and that three days later He walked out of that tomb victorious over death, buying us with His very own blood. Do we believe that? Isn't that important for us to believe? He's redeemed us through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Notice who He was, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him we were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Notice it. All things were made by Him. And notice why it was made. For Him. It's for His good pleasure. All things were made by Him and for Him. Do we believe that He is our Creator? Do we live like we believe He is our Creator? He is before all things. He is the preeminent One. There is nothing that comes before Him. Is there anything in life that we would put before our Creator? Surely not. Can we live though as though there's something could be important before Him. He said, don't let anything... He is the one that is before all things. And notice it now. By Him do all things consist. He is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence that before us should always be Him. Who do we imitate in life? We're supposed to imitate Him, Christian, Christ-like. One who follows Christ, one who imitates Christ, as though we were a mind, as though we were children walking in our Father's footsteps. We are to be imitators of Him. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And notice this, isn't this a beautiful picture in verse 20? And having made peace through the blood of His cross... By Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Because at some time we were alienated and enemies in our minds by wicked works. Yet now He has reconciled us. He made peace for us. The Father said, God said, There can be no wickedness in my presence. The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Sin causes death, doesn't it? The word he used for death is a violent, physical, bloody death. He said the day that you eat of that fruit, you're surely going to die. And Jesus said, no, I will pay the price. My blood will pay the price. I will die the violent, physical, bloody death for all mankind. And so doing, brought peace, able to join the hand of God and the hand of man together and say, peace, reconciled, brought back together. When you reconcile two people, 
What do you do? You bring them back together. He says He's reconciled us. He's brought us back together. Verse 23, notice that what He says, if you continue ground, can continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which has been preached to every creature which of heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. How amazing. He says, just stay grounded. Just stay settled. Don't let someone come and, and, and pull you away. Notice in chapter 2, he continues this idea in verse 7. He says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. He says, root yourself in, ground yourself in, dig in for a battle. It would be like World War II where they dug the trenches and they got down in the trenches and they said, we're staying right here. We're not going any farther back. If we're going anywhere, we're pushing forward. He says, dig in. It's a war rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as we have been taught with thanksgiving. In verse 10, He says, We're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Verse 12, this is such an important verse. He says, Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with Him through faith of the operation of God, who has raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. Verse 12 will lead us into chapter 3. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with Him, through the faith of the operation of God. If you have been buried, you have died. And if you have died, you have been risen with Him by your faith. And notice it says in verse 3, chapter 1, And if you've been risen, if you then be risen with Christ. Are you risen with Christ? Have you been buried with Him? If you haven't been buried with Him, you can't be risen with Him. He says, If you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. This is where our belief is. Do we believe He's risen? Do we believe He's sitting on the right hand of God? And if we believe that, then our conviction will be, verse 2, to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That will be our convictions. We're going to set our eyes towards heaven and that's where we're going to follow. And then our actions will be verse 3. For you are dead and your life is hid in Christ, or hid with Christ in God. Set your minds, your affections, set your mind on things above, not on things below. Because as we looked at this morning, what happens to everything here below? It's all going to be burned up, isn't it? It's all going to be melted. He said, don't focus everything about what's important here. Focus about what's important there. For you are dead. What do you mean we're dead? I'm still standing here, am I not? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not... I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So I am dead because my life is now hid with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ, who notice it? I love this verse. May this be said of all of us. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Can it be said of us, Christ is our life. It's not just someone we follow. It's not just something we do. He is who I am. I am a follower of His. He is the center of everything that I do. Every decision I make is based upon Him. Everything that I say or don't say 
is based upon Him. Have you ever been so angry you wanted to say something, but you had that thought come to your head? What would Jesus do here? It's not just a bracelet. It's not just a few letters people wear around their arm. What would He have us to do? If we were walking with Jesus and someone did to us in His presence what they just did to us, what would His response be? How would He react? What would He say? That should be our focus because Christ has become our life. And if He has become our life, notice what it says, then you shall also appear with Him in glory. He says, if He becomes your life, don't question it, don't doubt it, don't worry about it, you will be with Him in glory. Therefore, verse 5 says, Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Mortify, put them to death. Those desires, those evil desires that are fornication and uncleanness and inordinate affection and evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry. He says, put all of those things away because those things that got to you, those things that were sin before, those things that destroyed you, at one time you walked in them, verse 7, at one time you lived them, at one time you had sin in, the, in your life that you practiced. He said, put those things away because you are dead. That person is gone. And while you're at it, verse 8, he says, while you're at it, put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communications out of your mouth. In verse 9, if you want to do harm to a relationship of any kind, if you want to hurt your spouse, if you want to hurt your child, lie to them. Is there anything worse than a lie? I don't know. You lose trust. He says, don't lie to one another. If we began to lie to one another, let's just say inside of a family, how well is that family going to work out once those lies come out? Not very good, is it? What about a family of Christians? If we began to lie to one another, what happens? How's that going to work out between us? Because lies are a web, aren't they? You start here, and in order to cover that one up, you've got to make a new one. Now you've got two of them. You have to remember two of them. Now that you've got two, you've got to tell one to cover that one up, and then the next one. And the next thing you know, you have an entire web of lies that you have to try to remember, and it's called a web because eventually you're going to catch yourself. And you're going to be tangled up. And people are going to understand that you can't be trusted. That's why he condemned it. He says Satan is the father of all lies, didn't he? And he says if we are liars, then we are of our father who? The devil. So he says lie not one to another, saying why? You've put off the old man who you were before. He's dead. You've put on a new man, renewed in knowledge, after the image of Him that created Him. This is what we have to believe. Because in verse 11, there is no more Greek, there is no more Jew, there is no more white, there is no more black, there is no circumcision, uncircumcision, there's no barbarian, there's no Scythian, there's no bond, there's no free, there's no American, there's no one from China, there's Christian. You're not a little group of Christians. You are Christians. That's all. You're not a hyphen... Christian. We're just faithful or not. We're not segments. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Notice what he says holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. This is compassionate hearts. Have compassionate hearts towards each other. How far would that go in a marriage? To be compassionate one towards another. How far will that go in raising children? To be compassionate. Are children going to make mistakes? Do we need to be compassionate? Did you make a mistake as a child? Don't lie. <laughs> Did you make a mistake? We all make mistakes. It says be compassionate towards each other. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Forbearing one another. I looked up that word forbearing. Interesting way to put it. Figuratively says to put up 
with each other. Sometimes you just have to put up with someone, don't you? And I say that this way. There are going to be personalities that aren't going to always get along, aren't there? Some personality types are going to clash. It happens. We're different. He says when that happens, put up (laughs) with each other. Don't split, don't divide, don't get angry, don't move away. He says, put up with each other and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against you, notice that even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. He says, if someone does you wrong, just forgive them and move on. You may say, but you don't know what he did to me. You don't know what he did. I know what you did. I know what I did. We killed the Son of God. Do you want Him to forgive you? Were we the reason He was there? Can I do worse than that? It says forgive Him as He forgave. Because if we don't forgive, what does He say? If you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. So forgive them. And above all these things... Put on charity. Put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. What is the glue that holds a family together? Love. What's a glue that holds a church together? Love. What's the glue that holds any people anywhere together? Love. Fear can only hold people together for so long. And what happens? War, fighting, and strife. So love. That is what holds us in the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are also called into one body and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule. Once we have a true love for each other, once we have a true forgiveness and an understanding of why we need to forgive others. Once we all come together of the same mind, there's no division, there's no fighting, there's no strife. Once we all come together in the same mind, teaching the same thing, notice what he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You'll have the peace of God if we can do that. Peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are also called into one body. And be thankful for that one body. Isn't it wonderful that we can all be in the same body? We all have the same head. We all have the same teaching. Anywhere you go in the world, you can stop in, walk into the doors on a Sunday morning. Now, there's not as many as there used to be. But you can sit down, meet and greet your brethren, knowing we teach the same thing, we believe the same thing, We worship the same God. We're going to see each other in heaven when we die. Anywhere you go, you can walk into that place where you know where they meet and be with family. You're not a stranger. We shouldn't feel like strangers. Strangers that visit shouldn't feel like strangers because honestly, what are they? They're our brothers, they're our sisters. And then in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace into your hearts to the Lord. Don't children need to hear us sing? Don't they need to hear us praising God? Don't they need to see us living that out? Is it important for our spouse to see us living out our faith daily? Isn't that important? And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And then He comes down and says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, 
for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke your children, or provoke not your children, to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but with singleness of heart, fearing God. Did you notice how he spent two whole chapters telling us how to believe, what we need to believe, what sets the entire foundation? And then he gets to the part about what fathers and mothers and, and children are supposed to do. And he gets to that part and he just goes, boom, and continues on. Isn't that interesting? Because if we get the first part, how to be faithful to God, if we get the first part, how to be faithful to each other, when you have a husband or a wife whose sole purpose is to be faithful to God, how's that going to make that marriage work? When you have a child who looks up to elders and who looks up to God before he ever considers looking up to his favorite player on his favorite sports team, how's that going to change the way that child thinks? How's it going to change the way that child acts? Whatever we do, Whatever we do, he says, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. Whatever you do, do it with all that you have, knowing that ye shall receive of the Lord the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for wrong, which he hath done. And notice that last part. And he's no respecter of persons. Does it matter if you're a king? Does it matter if you gather all of the armies of the world? You've taken over everything. You have the highest position. Guess what? What are you? At the end of the day, you came from the same place Adam did. We're dust. Alexander the Great conquered the world now lives in a box. No respecter of persons. Everyone's going to be judged the same. Did you do right? Did you do wrong? Did you follow me? Did you not follow me? Did you live for me? Did you kind of live for me? Or did you give everything you have for me? We're all going to have to answer that, aren't we? Does that make you nervous sometimes? To know that one day I'm going to stand before the Creator and He's going to say, did you do all that you could? That's a question, isn't it? That's a question we all have to answer one day. How are you tonight? How's your soul? If you were to die right now, and you were to go into eternity, where would you find yourself? Are you in Christ? In chapter 2, he says we have to die to self, and we have to be buried with Him in baptism. And then we have to raise to walk a newness of life. And once we've been raised, set our affections on things above, not on things below. How's your soul tonight? Do you believe that He is? Are you willing to be baptized into Christ? And if you've done that, have you set your affections on things above and not on things below? If you have any need, don't delay. We'll pray with you and we'll pray for you. Come now. While we stand and while we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing?